Welcome to uh, today's panel discussion on innovation with Diamond Technology, um, hosted by RFHIC. Um, RFHIC is the world's first and only GAN RFN microwave transistor to subsystem solution provider um, for various applications in wireless infrastructure, radar, um, and RFA energy. Um, we do provide a broad range of commercial uh, off-the-shelf and customizable products um, operating from DC to 40 gigahertz with power levels up to multi-megawatts. Um, so first, for some introductions, um, I'm Grace Cho. Um, I'm the Strategic Planning um, Marketing Team Manager at RFHC, and I have the pleasure today of moderating today's session. Um, and today, I am delighted to be joined by five of our tech panelists. Um, so first, uh, Daniel Twitchin, who is the Chief Technologist at Element 6. Um, Daniel carries over 25 years of experience in developing CBD diamond synthesis for optical, thermal, um, electrochemical, and sensing applications. Um, and he leads the E6's quantum program and commercial CBD team. Um, Stacey Armagos, who's the VP of um, IR Optics and Materials Division at 2.6. Um, so Stacey has over 30 years of uh, experience in optics and materials, and she and her team are focused on developing um, new capabilities and products enabling higher power industrial lasers, thermal management uh, solutions, and next-gen EUV systems. Um, next, we have Dr. Philip Borgonzo, who is the VP of Secchi Diamond Systems. Um, Dr. Borgonzo is responsible for promoting diamond synthesis and equipment distribution for the expansion of diamond technology. Um, and Secchi is a leading provider of CBD diamond reactors offering a broad selection of microwave plasma, hot filament, and low temperature CBD systems. Um, next, we have Professor Oliver Williams. Um, he's a professor of experimental physics at Cardiff University. Um, and he's also the head director of research at Cardiff Diamond Foundry. Um, Oliver works on applications of diamond films and particles ranging from CBD growth of thin films to bulk materials. And last but not least, um, Dr. Wenzong Lee. He's the director of Ganon Diamond Division at RFHIC. Um, Dr. Lee has over 30 years of experience in gallium nitride. Um, he and his team are developing the world's first uh, high power Ganon Diamond hemp for commercial production level performance. Hello, folks. How are you all doing? Very good, thanks. Very well. All right, super. So well, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, but before we do jump into our session, uh, let me say a few housekeeping updates for our audience. So this webinar is being recorded um, and will be available for all registered attendees within the next 24 hours. Um, so, and also if you have any questions throughout the webinar, um, please do upload your questions to the, to the Q&A chat room to the side of the screen. And we'll definitely address those uh, during our Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, and specifically, we do recommend you when you do ask a question into the chat room that you specify a specific panelist that you would like us to address the question towards. And uh, if we don't get to answer your questions today, um, we will definitely have a member of our team reach out to you within the next couple of days uh, with an answer as well. So I guess with that settled, um, here's the agenda for today. Um, so I guess I'll start by giving our audience just an overview of our topic, um, and then I'll let our you know panels uh, present with their insights about the futures of diamond technology um, to their respective applications by answering some of our questions. Um, like I mentioned before, you know we'll have time at the end for some audience questions towards the end, so please do send them in now, and we'll have a chat to those later on. Great. So. Um, so I guess a short overview of our topic on diamond innovation. Um, so I guess very many of you probably know the famous saying, uh, diamond is a girl's best friend. Um, but in recent years, that phrase has definitely caught on within the tech industry and especially the semiconductor industry. Um, and that, that phrase has kind of changed to, you know, diamonds are an engineer's best friend. Diamonds are um, a high power engineer's best friend. Um, and, and the diamonds that we're referring to are synthetic diamonds that are grown used um, either using high pressure, high temperature, um, just HPHT, 
or chemical vapor deposition, uh, which is also commonly referred to as CBD processes. So I guess you know when we get past that you know romantic notion of you know diamond is is one heck of an engineering material, um, you know diamonds are the hardest material known to mankind, and you know they make a very excellent abrasive um, and protective coating for you know various applications, you know from industrial tools to you know, kitchen work surfaces. So um, also for you know semiconductor or electronic applications, uh, diamonds are known to dissipate heat more uh, rapidly than you know, commonly used uh, materials such as silicon um, within the semiconductor industry. So uh, a lot of researchers are definitely developing ways to implement you know diamond into their chip making processes, um, you know allowing them to. Uh, get more components on a smaller surface while you know maintaining excellent efficiency and high power levels. So um, I guess with that overview set, um, I'm going to set the scene by kicking off our first question to Stacy, who is the VP of IR Optics and Materials at 26. Um, Stacy, could you tell me um, what is it about diamonds that makes you and your team passionate? Okay, so thank you, Grace, for hosting. Um, for for 2.6, we are the company where materials matter. So um, this material, we have a long history, 50 year history almost at 2.6. And it's really started with the base materials and uh, through vertical integration. So for uh, diamond, because of the unique properties, as you've already mentioned, the hardness, um, the uh, broad uh, transmission uh, specifications, um, we believe that this material hasn't even started to see the um, full potential that it has. So our co-founder, Carl Johnson, actually called this the 100-year material. Um, so I think that's a great quote to kind of uh, think about because, you know, usually there's a lifetime with materials that can be uh, replaced by other materials, but I think it's going to be difficult given the properties uh, that and the uniqueness uh, that Diamond has to be able to replace that anytime soon. So um, we're excited about it uh, because we see a broad range of application, uh, whether it's thermal, optical, mechanical, um, I think there's a big future for where Diamond is going to go. So we're excited about it and um, we think it has a lot of potential. That's awesome. Thanks for that. Um, I also want to throw kind of the same question out to uh, Dr. Philip Bergonzo, who's the VP of Secchi Diamond Systems. Um, you know, being a leading leading provider of CVD diamond reactors, um, what are kind of some of your thoughts on diamonds that make you and your team passionate at Secchi Diamonds? Well, thank you, Grace. And uh, well, basically, the uh, remarkable. Uh, Interest for diamond is really the diversity of the materials you can grow, you can synthesize. Uh, diamond can take a lot of uh, aspects and shapes, and uh, and it's uh, very important to be able to tune this shape according to the way you can exploit the geometry or the characteristics you want to take uh, into your device. Uh, you know, you can fabricate diamond to make electronic devices, like Stacy said. Uh, I, I spent a lot of my time making radiation detectors when I was doing research. Diamond is also very good to make quantum sensors. I guess probably Danielle will mention about this, or electrochemical sensors, heat spreaders, and so on. Uh, probably the five panelists around the table, we all have very different background and very needs for different types of materials. And today, it's very difficult to grow, uh, you know, a big cube of diamond uh, like we do for the semiconductors. Uh, we cannot grow uh, crystals of uh, 30 uh, centimeter diameter uh, like we do for silicon. So we always have to optimize the dimension of the synthetic layer we fabricate according to the performance we want to use. Uh, you know, a quantum sensor is very small, a heat spreader has to match the size of your substrate you want to cool, therefore it can be 4, 5, 6, 8, 12 inch, why not? Uh, a biological implant uh, can be very thin, uh, 10 micron will be enough, but it needs to be very flexible. And uh, this is this diversity that uh, we work on uh, at Seki Diamond System to make sure that our reactors are able to provide 
tools for people to be able to fabricate those materials and help uh, our customers to really grow the material they need and uh, and of course the, uh, the the properties they want to uh, to obtain from these materials so it's this diversity that is very uh, uh, crucial for diamond that's, that's fascinating. Um, thank you for that. So um, to move on to question two, um, I know I touched base on this a little earlier, but um, I want to get an expert's uh, a point of view on this. So Daniel, do you think you can kind of briefly explain to me or to our audience um, about lab-grown diamonds um, in terms of how they're processed and, and how come, kind of uh, they can be used for you know various electronic applications? Sure, <clears throat> sure, thanks, Grace. So really there's two parts to that question and, and, and the first and they was the second and the second we've heard a little bit about some of the applications and I'll talk about that in a moment but the first really was the development and synthesis process so to, to tap into diamond remarkable properties you need to be able to grow it reproducibly um, and the key for that really over the last 20 years has been progress in growing diamond using chemical vapor deposition techniques and, and in its simplest form you create a hot gas that hot gas it's full of hydrogen and methane. And if you like, the magic trick is breaking down the molecular hydrogen into atomic hydrogen. And then you can deposit carbon on a much cooler substrate. The carbon goes down both as graphite and as sp3 as diamond. But atomic hydrogen etches away the, the graphite much faster than the diamond. And for, for 30 odd years, people didn't believe you could even grow diamond in this part of the phase diagram. But by, by developing those techniques, it's been possible to actually grow wafer scale diamond and here's actually a, it not, a thick piece about two millimeters thick piece of diamond um, 100 millimeters across and, and and the properties of that diamond probably less than half a percent of natural diamonds match so it's so natural diamonds by the nature of their growth process have properties that are often a long way away from perfect diamond by developing chemical vapor deposition techniques it's been possible to tap into those perfect properties of diamond Again, with the chemical vapor deposition technique, you get all the benefits. You can think, add things into the gas phase, dope the diamond. So, for example, while this is obviously transparent, this wafer here is opaque. And, and the difference here really is I've added a lot of boron to the gas phase. And now, all of a sudden, this wafer is conducting. So, it's an interesting, robust electrode. So, that progress in, in synthesis, and you heard Philippe talk a little, little bit about the hardware earlier, is allowed engineers and scientists to begin to really tap in reproducibly to the material properties. We've heard a bit about those material properties earlier, but thermal conductivity, the thermal conductivity of the diamond is more than five times higher than copper. It can exceed 2000 watts per meter per K. It's a wide band gap, so if you need to hold off a high voltage, you can sustain a high voltage. It's low density, so you think about electronics, sometimes weight's a factor, especially if you want to put electronics in space, size, weight, and power matters, so the density is low. Um, chemically inert, so what makes this electrode so interesting, yes it conducts, but in solution it can, you can produce very powerful oxidants and those oxidants can be used to break them down organic waste, byproducts and maybe the pharmaceutical industry or to sanitize your desk even, but the great thing is the diamond is inert so actually it doesn't erode, so you get the, the performance and also the lifetime. And I'm sure Juan Sang is going to talk more about the thermal applications, but when we talk about data, you know, we all take data increasingly for granted. Data is the new utility. Wherever we go, we can download email, we can download our Netflix movie. And really at the heart of that is, is gigabytes of data per dollar. And, and the advances in technology has enabled that. And one of those significant advances is which I've I see a really big forefront is gallium nitride. Um, in some of these gallium nitride transistors, the power densities are in excess of tens of kilowatts per square centimeter. And even as a, as a physicist, when I try and comprehend what tens of kilowatts per square centimeter is, it's phenomenal. But to really get the full potential from that GAN device, you've got to dissipate that heat. So if you can get the diamond close to that heat source, the best conductive heat can dissipate that heat. And of course, in device terms, that means you can push more power up, you can get a, a better linear device, reliability more than 50 percent of failure modes in, in electronics is still heat related so you get more reliability so so diamonds remarkable properties in access to this tbd technique and then all of a sudden now we're starting to see, see them being used 
Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I think I just learned so much more about diamonds from that explanation. Um, thank you for that. So, um, Dr. Lee, from you know a high power RF and microwave uh, applications point of view, um, what are kind of some of your thoughts on on lab grown diamonds that you know maybe Daniel didn't touch base on, and you know what are kind of the types of uh, impacts that you know that they could have for the RF and microwave field? Okay, thank you for invitation. I fully. The, agree with the, the Daniel's opinion. So, as you knew that, the using diamond technology, RFHIC has a plan to using power amplifier solution in the area of high frequency microwave systems. To adapt this application, diamond should be make round shape, the Daniel show, the round shape vapor for semiconductor processing. So I believe that such a method of lab-grown diamond technology is an only solution to make our goal. Currently, lab-grown diamond can be possibly make four-inch vapor size, as well as maximum six-inch vapor size with acceptable the cost of industrial application for microwave and RF application. For example, currently lab-grown diamond can be possibly easy to making around 1500 watt per millikelvin thermal conductivity. But in the future, we can also can be possibly make up to 2000 watt per millikelvin. If we can get a such kind of that the goal, we can get a lot of benefit in terms of reduce the power consumption increasing expense of like that. So I believe lab grown diamond is our future. It's a key factor to improving all of the application in the semiconductor field. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So, I mean, it definitely seems like, you know, diamond is being sought out, you know, by physicists and engineers, you know, worldwide. Um, so I guess, Oliver, coming from an academic standpoint of view, you know, what are kind of some of the diamond features that you see being important that, you know, maybe we haven't mentioned uh, thus far, um, and that's kind of respective to your application. Okay, thanks, Grace. Um, I think Dan did a very good job of going over a lot of the properties. So if I was to pick one thing that sort of ruled them all, it would probably be the atomic density of diamond, because so many things kind of fall out of that. And if, it, if I didn't have one and a half, I'd say it's that plus the fact that it's carbon. So because you have this extremely dense lattice of carbon atoms, it's very hard, I think everyone, everyone sort of knows that. But there's a bunch of other consequences from that. So one is the thermal conductivity, right? So this, this, is, this is extreme, Dan's already pointed this out. But what I think what a lot of people don't appreciate about that is it's one of the, well, it's the only one that I'm aware of that has a high resistivity at the same time. I mean, the next best is aluminum nitride, which is one fifth, and that's a huge drop. So you have a, you know, an insulating material um, electrically that is firmly very, very conductive. And that's that's highly unusual. Um, the other thing that falls out also from this short bond, bond length from the fact that the little carbon atoms don't weigh very much, you know, the low density. So like Dan mentioned, it's low density, but it's high atomic density, right? It's just the carbon atoms don't weigh very much, right? Um, is that, you, you know, the acoustic wave velocity in diamond is very, very high. So as I'm speaking to you, I mean, if we ignore the internet for a minute and pretend we're in the same room, you know, the sound would be moving at 300 meters per second, but in diamond it's 20,000 meters per second. And so this has a huge consequence because you, you're able to operate very high frequency filters. You'll be able to build, make devices that vibrate very, very quickly. And I think this is very interesting for physicists. And um, the final thing would be would to go back to the sort of quantum technologies. I mean, one of the advantages of having a very dense lattice is that impurities don't readily go into diamonds. So if you think, you know, back in history, one of the reasons why germanium failed as a semiconductor, well, failed is a bit harsh, but, you know, it was, was taken over by silicon. One was a native oxide. But the other one is that actually germanium, as it's further down in the periodic table, actually suffers from really uh, purity problems. It's actually quite difficult to grow germanium very high purity. Which, if you look at the results of element six, whatever, in high purity diamond, they're really staggeringly pure. And this is, I think, in a quantum point of view, very, very important. That and the divide temperature, which I think I won't, I won't say any more about that. I think I'll leave it to Dan later. But I think that the main thing for me is this bond length. Yeah. Well, that was very insightful. Um, so, I mean, after hearing a lot of your answers, it, it definitely seems like, you know, Diamond's key characteristic is definitely, you know, its toughness. So, you know, being able to withstand such, you know, harsh environments, you know, whether that be, you know, high temperatures or high pressures. 
But, you know, on the flip side of things, you know, being the toughest material known to mankind, I, I would think that it comes with a lot of, you know, challenges in, in terms of handling such a material. So, Stacey, could you kind of share a story of some of the biggest challenges that maybe, you know, uh, your team have faced, you know, in terms of handling this material? Sure, Chris. So, um, very good question because, you know, the material is one thing, but getting it to the end product is really the key, what the customers care about. Um, so, you know, 26 has many years of experience with Diamond, but, you know, one of the challenges was, first of all, you know, we're a vertically integrated uh, company. So, you know, the growth of it through the polishing, the coding, and even the assembly in some cases, each has its own unique challenges. So from the growth standpoint, finding the right equipment, the right processes uh, that are robust enough to have repeatability, which is very important uh, from um, product to product, uh, piece to piece. So that's one of the things that was a challenge. Uh, the other thing is, is you know, we've been polishing material, whether it's gallium arsenide, zinc selenide, zinc sulfide, germanium, silicon for, for many years, but when you, and you have a lot of different grits that are available for those abrasive uh, polishes that you need for uh, these materials. But when you get to diamond, you know, it's already a hard material. So as you try to polish uh, diamond, there's all new challenges that you have to face. So we really work on the processes and improvements uh, of those uh, particular areas to really uh, understand the material and to work to find solutions. Um, so I would say those are some of the big challenges. The other thing is I think people are, the challenge is still sometimes the price of the uh, product. Um, that's something people don't think about. You know, diamond is relatively uh, expensive uh, compared to other materials, um, but we do believe that there is value proposition and as the technology continues to develop and the configurations that we can do with the materials, the sizes that we can produce, um, I think that uh, people will realize, you know, like you said before, if I were an engineer, this is a material that I would want to be considering for any of my design applications. Right, right, right. Right. So, I mean, it definitely seems like um, in order to come up with the most you know, ideal solutions, we definitely need to fulfill, um, you know, both sides of the spectrum in terms of, you know, having a great material, but also having great equipment in, in order to handle this material as well. Absolutely. So, you know, as you know, having talked about the challenges, especially on the materials side, you know, I know our factory C is currently developing, you know, again, on diamond hemp devices, you know, for various uh, semiconductor applications. So Dr. Lee, you know, could you kind of share some of your biggest challenges that you and your team faced, um, especially yeah. on the high side? Yeah, the, actually, the all of our the the, the customer did something that comes out the newly developed Ganon Diamond hemp divide. So currently, our team is working very hard to make our goal. So as you knew that the RFHIC developing Ganon Diamond hemp for RF application using the Ganon Diamond epi wrapper, we called. Godai epi wrapper. Due to CT niche match, the Garon Diamond epi wrapper has a huge bow and warping, such same as we call Pringles potato chips, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, so due to wafer thickness, the Garon Diamond epi wrapper was easy to crack, such same crispy as Pringles potato chips as well. So the former, we uh, used conventional method, the bonding technology using silicon carbide substrate. But such kind of that technology can be possibly making the small quantity of the Ganon diamond, the uh, hemp. But in the future, they technology cannot easy to accept the consistency and then mass production something like that. So such kind of the, such kind of handling the issues is a big barrier to start the semiconductor processing at automated fab the line, something like that. So the dually RFHIC is a developed, we call 
permanent bonding technology. That technology used diamond silicon vapor. We attach that the carrier under the 1000 degrees C. So that means using that technology, we don't need any bonding, debonding technology during processing. As well as such kind of that technology can be possibly the can remove all kind of the breakage issue during the processing due to total thickness is around 750 micron thick. So using those kind of permanent bonding technology, we believe that Ganon Diamond hemp can be possibly to start of the production stage under the consistent process status. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm definitely thrilled to hear that, you know, you and your team were able to kind of overcome, you know, such challenges. And um, I'm very excited to see uh, our FHAC scan on diamond coming to fruition soon. Um, so, you know, as, as we discuss uh, further, you know, it seems like diamond can be used for various applications, um, especially, you know, very promising features like uh, industrial commercial um, or industrial uh, commercial defense radars, um, as well as, as well as, you know, wireless infrastructure. Um, you know, those are kind of promising factor uh, applications utilizing diamond technology. But, you know, aside from that, you know, diamond can be used in, you know, various applications. So, um, Oliver, what are kind of some of the interesting applications that you have worked with or are currently working with um, that you think will kind of drive this tech forward in your respective area? Sure, and, and we, we have an activity on uh, diamond growth integration to aluminium, uh, sorry, gallium nitride as well, for um, aluminium nitride interlayers. Um, but we also look at other materials like um, uh, gallium oxide, you know, it's kind of the new kid on the block that's very strongly thermally limit limited as well. And that, that's very challenging because it's, it's not very stable in diamond growth environments, so you have to play a lot of uh, games to make it work. Um, so I, I won't say too much about the thermal because I think there are people that do more in that area than I do. Um, we, we have a lot of activities on acoustic filtering. So we, we operate surface acoustic wave filters at around 20 gigahertz at a Q around 50,000. So, um, you know, these are, you know, pushing into frequencies in the 5G that your conventional lithium nibate won't operate in. At the same time, they'll handle power loads that will, you will not be able to do with a standard oxide. So this is, I think, a fairly interesting technology. It's very challenging. It's not, it's not easy, um, you know, because you're trying to displace, a, a, you know, an incumbent te technology, you know. So fortunately, in this area, mostly it, it's not really possible with the current technology. Uh, and then the slightly wacky thing I just wanted to mention for fun is that, you know, we also build superconducting NEMs, right? So we, we make superconducting cantilevers out of diamond. Uh, so diamond is the only superconductor that has a high acoustic wave velocity, which is a bit weird. Um, and it's a bit hard to explain in a way. But I mean, that, that opens up some interesting possibilities. So I, I don't want to go off down the, the, you know, the sort of um, off the tangent of superconducting circuits or anything, but it offers a possibility to entangle quantum states like, you know, superconducting states and actual mechanical states in the cantilever, which is a, it's a sort of holy grail in physics of looking for this um, zero point motion. I mean, a lot of people are trying to detect you know, if a device is stationary, a physical device, it actually has to move. Because otherwise, if it doesn't, it's violating uncertainty principle. And Diamond is a route to look at that. I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of competition in this area and very smart people. But I think the fact that it's a superconductor is very interesting because from IR detection and other applications, Diamond could be, you know, could be interesting in the future. But this is very new, so I wouldn't want to bet anything on it. That's, that's really fascinating. Um, thank you for that. So um, in terms of, you know, I just kind of want to dig a little bit deeper into this question. So I know, you know, Dr. Borgonzo mentioned earlier about, you know, diamond technology kind of being used for, you know, even bio implant applications, um, which, you know, I find to be fascinating. Uh, Dr. Borgonzo, could you maybe explain a little bit more about this application and kind of let our audience know, you know, why diamond could possibly be a, high desir a highly desirable candidate for, uh, you know, biomedical applications. Yeah, thank you, of course. Uh, this is quite a, a very exotic type of application that really exploits a lot of properties together of diamond. So, uh, you know, uh, here we talk about uh, thin and flexible foils of diamond uh, with uh, conductive uh, embedded electrodes inside made of diamond as well. And the advantage is that uh, these uh, electrodes can be in direct contact with neurons or, uh, uh, you know, uh, live tissues 
in order to enable uh, cell uh, signal recording or stimulation. Uh, this uh, applies to uh, any um, deficient uh, losses of uh, faculty like uh, vision or hearing or, or brain issues with epilepsy and so on. And uh, so all the time you need to make a long foil uh, long is being uh, for a, a small animal, typically three, four centimeters, probably, or uh, and for humans, it's rather five or six centimeters. So to start with, you need to be able to grow at least four inch or six inch substrates. And uh, on those, you need to make uh, a, a multiple series of uh, uh, like uh, nanotech uh, lithography and so on in order to make that device. Uh, for example, you need uh, small electrodes that are the size of uh, neuron cells. So uh, neuron cells are typically a few tens of microns. So you need to have uh, point electrodes that are maybe uh, 30 to 50 microns. And, uh, and then these need to be uh, flexible in a flexible material, because if you put a lump of uh, glass inside the eye, or the, then of course you understand that you will cut the tissues. Also, you need the surgeon to be able to manipulate the material in order to insert it into the eye or the cortex again. And uh, so the applications are, you know, these, these type of device exist today uh, with other materials than diamond. And, uh, and they use, for example, for monitoring epilepsy disease or things like this, but it's always for a, a few weeks maximum experiments. If you want to stimulate the retina for a blind person or, or the hearing uh, for, uh, for a deaf person, then you need basically a lifetime. Like we people have done for pacemakers, you need to be able to have a device that is uh, compatible with in vivo uh, biocompatibility uh, uh, embedded in a material that is uh, completely, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, not letting water get in. And at the end of the day, these challenges are, are all summarized in, a, in a, the necessity to have a tool that needs to be uh, uh, capable to provide uh, large area growth, selective growth, clean room compatible, uh, high lithography and so on. We have some customers doing this. I was myself involved in doing this for some years as well. There is um, uh, There are a few companies working on this. There is one in Paris called Pixium Vision. I, I encourage you to go and see their website and buy shares if you want. Uh, <laughs> Pixium is manufacturing uh, retina implants for blind people. And, uh, and now on the cortex, this is still a research uh, field. Uh, we have a customer in Paris called um, ACA, it's a university, and uh, there is a website on the project they have to uh, monitor uh, cortex signals and also to stimulate the cortex directly to, uh, to procure vision to blind people as well. The project is called NeuroDiam, NeuroDiam and uh, .eu. Just go okay. and have a look. Yeah. Okay, will do. I mean, that's, I mean, that's really fascinating. You know, I never imagined, you know, diamond materials, you know, being used for biomedical applications, let alone, you know, retina implants. So um, I definitely can see the future of diamond reshaping the, the medical industry as well. Um, so I guess to move on to our next question. So, you know, it seems like that synthetic diamonds will definitely have a significant market opportunity, not just, you know, in electronics, but, you know, also in various applications, like you mentioned earlier in biomedical um, applications. So I'm assuming, you know, having such a significant market, um, it's it's bound to have some type of, you know, technical or political issues that can, you know, hinder the advancements of, of certain technologies. So Dr. Bogonzo, what are kind of some of the factors that you um, are seeing limiting the adoption of synthetic diamonds within, within this market? Okay, well, this is, I think, a difficult question. And, uh, and if you ask the different panelists, I'm sure you will have different answers. My point of view is that uh, uh, there are um, a lot of uh, what I would call sort, sort of uh, indirect political issues. Basically, no one now can grow big diamonds. I mean, big diamonds as big as what you have in, uh, in big uh, gemstones and so on. Or, and these exist in nature. They are very rare, but they exist. And, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, they have been rare much before the technology have made them very expensive. 
you know, if you if we talk about uh, the British Crown uh, diamonds or the um, the uh, the Cullinan diamonds, the British Sovereign Sceptre, and so on, these are several centimeter big diamonds, and they exist and they've been there for a long time, and they don't have any price. And um, but they exist and they were there much before uh, people were able to grow diamond. If you compare this with another semiconductor like silicon. It didn't exist before, and people have considered that uh, big uh, wafers of silicon were, you know, uh, a new device, new technology. And uh, you can do similar things with diamond, but not that big today. And, uh, and that's why it's, uh, the problem is that all these material that we can synthesize in a lab or using uh, uh, an equipment, then we realize that these equipments uh, may be able to provide you a tool that if you succeed to make a huge diamond, then, uh, well, what do you do? Do you, do you keep on manufacturing a technological device or do you earn a fortune by uh, making, uh, you know, gemstones? And this is really, uh, this is really uh, a point that uh, everyone is always uh, uh, exposed to when you work on, uh, on, um, on diamond grows. I give a, a very simple example. Um, there is a technique called heteroepitaxy. Heteroepitaxy is, uh, is a technique to take another substrate uh, and to try to grow diamond on top of this substrate over a large area. Uh, heteroepitaxy stands for uh, making uh, epitaxy on, uh, on another crystal than, uh, than the crystal we are growing on. So basically, to make diamond, generally you need to take a diamond. But if you can do this on other types of materials, then you can make a large area diamond. There is a group in Germany, uh, in Augsburg. Uh, everybody knows him. Uh, he's a rock star in the community. He's called Matthias Schreck. And they've worked on this for about uh, 25 years. In the mid-90s, they were already starting on the topic. In 2000, they made the first demonstration of the feasibility of making uh, heteroepitaxy of diamond. And a couple of years ago, uh, two, three years ago, they published an article where they were able to make a almost single crystal of uh, 90 millimeter in diameter. So it's not like a heat spreading coating like we've been talking before, which is generally a polycrystalline. It's just like little grains of diamond. This is much closer to single crystal diamond. So they created a company to sell those, uh, those substrates. You'll find it under the name Odia Tech for Al uh, Augsburg Diamond Technology in Germany. And uh, the problem is that they will never sell a 90 millimeter wafer. And because uh, if they do, then they lose their job. And, uh, and uh, you know, if they give it to some group that can grow the culinum, then the other group will get uh, much richer as well than they could do. So this is, this is really a limitation for, uh, for the expansion of diamond in terms of uh, the fact that every time you grow something close to a gemstone, then you have to consider the fact that uh, this material may have more value than the electronic device you may make you may make out of it. And uh, so this is really, I think, uh, the, 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 if one can make gemstone for diamond, it's, uh, it's really limiting the adoption of diamond as a technological product on the market because the price is always there. Uh, we always have to consider that uh, you know, if you can make uh, 300 millimeter substrates, then uh, you have to think that uh, this may have a value somehow in terms of carats and so on. So this is this is a problem we have with diamond with respect to other semiconductors, where this doesn't exist. Right. I'm sure Daniel may have some uh, uh, things to add to this because he's very close to element six, who is uh, you know uh, a leader on uh, you know. Uh, a part of the beer. So uh, this is every time you work on diamond, you have to consider these things. <laughs> but um, we have about uh, two minutes left before we you know we jump into Q and A. So for our last question, um, I just want to kind of uh, sum up what we've all discussed um, and ask you know, Dr. Lee, what is kind of your outlook on the diamond industry and, and what kind of applications within the RF and microwave landscape that you know you kind of see having you know the most impact? Yeah, definitely diamond technology has a great opportunity of high power and high efficiency electronic semiconductor device market. 
As you knew that, most of the radio frequency and microwave system need to make reduced their size as comparable high output power and reduce their power consumption. So I believe that diamond technology can be possibly give this solution soon. So I believe among those our group can be possibly makes up Nobel Prize. <laughs> Am I true? <laughs> right, 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 right. And I guess Daniel, um, from a materials perspective, you know, what what are kind of some of the market opportunities that you see being kind of the game changers? Um, so I completely agree with one saying. I think the drive for data we've heard will, from the back of gallium nitride will continue, and and I think diamond playing a role under the hemp, the transistor. And also in, in terms of the terminator, the resistive elements in the one RF circuit. And I think coming back to what Ollie said, as powers go up, it comes more pressure on the filters and on the switches. So I think there'll be some, some new progress and continue to grow. I mean, it, it's ironic in a way, I spent the first 10 years of my research career in Diamond trying to make Diamond as boring as possible. My supervisor used to say that crystals are like people, it's their defects which make them interesting. And my job in element six was to try and make Diamond really boring and the same every time. And, and interesting, over the last few years, obviously some of, the, some of the understanding what these defects, how they manipulate the properties and how they can make a make a electrode or it be a quantum spin qubit and how we can use that to measure magnetic fields. I think that's gonna be something we see some increasing progress in the next, next four to five years, especially with the boom around quantum technologies and uh, and medical sensing. I think in, in medical, I can't really comment on the implant application that Philippe talked about, but I think there are already tangible products out there which are doing meaningful things in terms of measuring devices, measuring things relevant to the medical industry using diamond. So, uh, but coming back to Stacey's point in the beginning, um, with Diamond, I would disagree with Philip with some of his comments about gems. I don't think that's really relevant to, to the challenge for Diamond. I think that the challenge in some ways, you know, 10 years ago, it's about how you make this bulk stuff. The next five to 10 years has been how to do the processing and add the value to it. I think the next five to 10 years is all about the integration. And, and that, I think, one saying that began on Diamond is a fantastic example of that. If we can solve those integration challenges, then we untap a whole new potential for diamond. Right, right. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, diamonds being used for, you know, dental like crowns. So in, instead of <laughs> gold, you know, now they can be utilized with diamonds. They're used in the drills. So you can get them to <laughs> the, the problem with having a diamond tooth, of course, it'd wear everything else away. All righty. So uh, we got about uh, 10 to 15 minutes left on our webinar. So I will definitely open up the floor to the audience for some Q&A. Uh, let's see. Published. So I have one question for Dr. Berganzo. So how can hard materials like diamonds, can, can they maybe uh, made flexible? I think you mentioned earlier about um, for the, rec uh, the retina applications that you know, the diamonds have to be flexible. Oh, your mic is off. It characterizes uh, characterize, characterize the elasticity of the material. So uh, yeah, the Young's modulus of diamond is one of the highest uh, in uh, all materials, again. And so uh, just like the speed of sound mentioned by, uh, by uh, Oliver or the thermal conductivity, diamond uh, unmatch uh, a lot of uh, technical properties. And, and one of them here is the Young's modulus. You can make a 20 micron uh, membrane of diamond and it is extremely flexible. So you can bend it and, uh, and uh, if you make it 10 micron or eight micron, you can uh, really manipulate it in order to get it uh, fitting the, uh, the curvature of the eyeball or the, uh, the cortex basically, just because diamond is extremely flexible. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the next yeah. question is, um, is there a technology overlap of DLC, which is a diamond-like coating or PVD or CVD um, that's used in thin, uh, thin film tools 
and tribological coatings to synthetic diamond growth for the thin, uh, thin micrometer range, um, as mentioned in medical applications. Sure. Uh, I can say something about that if that helps. I mean, you see an airplane behind me. Um, one of the things, the big drivers in diamond tools over the last five, 10 years is machining new hard ceramics. So, so that plane behind me is made in carbon fiber reinforced plastic. That's a very hard, brittle, abrasive ceramic. And for the plane industry, that's great because it's very lightweight. So that's what's helped to get the CO2, the CO2 emissions up down from the, from the plane industry. The challenge is with the ceramic is how to machine it. And, and, and one of the really the go-to solution these days is a diamond coated carbide tool. So be tungsten carbide, which have been traditionally used, but now a thin diamond coating on that. And there's a, the blazer properties of diamond means you can actually drill holes efficiently through these, these hard ceramics. And I would ask, I would uh, add, go ahead, add go ahead, for a second, Don Daniels is, you know, two six also has different materials uh, like thermodite out of our M cubed area where it's hard materials. And that's one of the ideas is to have those thin films go over that material. So as Daniel was saying, they become uh, stronger and a, a better option for maybe uh, the materials that don't have that capability. So, and two six currently already has a diamond overcoat that we do on certain materials like zinc selenide that is biocompatible that is used inside the human body. So I think that definitely you're going to see that transition uh, to some of the thin films that we're doing with the uh, CBD process diamond that will also come into play. So I would agree. Um, the next question is uh, for Dr. Lee. Do you kind of see any limitations on Ganon diamond um, in terms of frequency range? Um, especially for the use for, you know, communication bands, like including, you know, millimeter waves and higher frequency ranges. But uh, the, we still the evaluating the how high frequency can be made using the Garon diamond. But I believe theoretically Garon diamond hemp can be possibly covered up to 100 gigahertz easily. Um, and the next question is, um, in terms of, you know, thermal properties, um, I know, you know, diamond is probably uh, one of the most thermally, uh, hold on a second, conductive products, but where did that question go? Um, I guess I'll just skip to a different, different question. Um, I guess um, a person asked, how soon will we be able to purchase fully qualified uh, Ganon diamond transistors from RFHAC? <laughs> uh, so I got the same question every day from my boss. <laughs> 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 yeah, I really hope so. But the, 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 we still keep working and then possibly maybe next until the within two years we hope so there's some get some the new and high qualified gain on diamond selling to our the targeting market yeah to be continued okay <laughs> and, and if i can sorry if i can just add to Wong sang's previous answer for the rf guys out there who, who don't know one of the key properties that help down work at high frequency, it's very low dielectric loss. So when you think about your RF circuit, you're worried about inductive and capacitance losses. But the fact it has an intrinsic low dielectric loss is one of the reasons why an RF circuit you can push the frequencies up without compromising performance. Um, so it's just really that power of thermal conductivity and dielectric loss that allows pushes you into new areas. Right, right, right. So I guess the, the second question I wanted to ask um, you, Daniel, was, you know, it seems like there are advantages in terms of, you know, thermal properties with respect to, again, um, on silicon carbide, you know, however, at lower uh, frequency ranges, you know, lower than one gigahertz applications, um, considering the size of, you know, devices, is there an advantage compared to, you know, LDMOS technology compared for, especially for thermal properties? Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't know enough to really be able to answer that question. I think we, we have seen historically, so so 
in the simplest form, there's two approaches to how diamonds used to enhance thermal performance of the bias. One is is really trying to get the diamond very integral to the device, like growing the diamond on the, the gallium nitride, similar to what Von Zang talked about with Ganon diamond. The second is a singulated approach, or what's typically Ganon silicon or um, gallium arsenide, and then attaching it to a diamond heat spreader. And you might attach it through a hard solder. And we certainly saw 10, 15 years ago, gallium arsenide device performance being pushed down at the one gigahertz and below by solving the thermal properties. Um, it was always a niche applications, applications where performance really made a big difference in things like satellite comms. But um, there is a benefit. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to cost per performance benefit. Right, right. In terms of cost now, yeah, right? Um, so the next question is uh, for Dr. Lee. What are kind of the power levels um, that are kind of uh, available for uh, 5G or wireless infrastructure that's capable with diamond technology? Uh, depend on the which type of the system the customer need, but something that we can the often vary something not only a small the small size of maybe the low 10 watt up to maybe the 50 watt or 100 watt, we can possibly make some same, the, the, the comparable by the small form factor, something like that. So we can, has a lot of the opportunity to overcome such kind of that uh, market demand when we using the Ganon Diamond hand technology. So the next question is for also for Di uh, Daniel. So what are kind of some of the unique examples um, of applications for the transparent diamond coated wafer that you, you were this talking one. about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, okay, so first thing, not all products are this big. I mean, <laughs> we will grow it away from be cut, cut down much smaller. But um, I mean, one classic example, which Stacy talked about is in high power laser system for EUV lithography. So believe it or not, seven, nine nanometer EUV lithography is driven by very high power CO2 lasers coupling into a tin plasma. And these lasers might be 20 to 30 kilowatts. So you're coupling a huge amount of infrared power through an optical window. The diamond's transparent, but again, because it's great conducting the heat away when there's losses, it's really enabling that those high power lasers and, and directly helping to enable EUV lithography, which we all benefit from in our phones and our laptops. So, so that's one example. I think that the second example, which is still technology of the future, and that's particularly what this window is for, is for fusion, high energy fusion reactors. So where you're trying to couple, couple something like a one or two megawatts of microwave power into a tritium plasma. So you think megawatt now we're talking about power. So believe it or not, this window couples two megawatts of microwave power into a fusion reactor. So if, if fusion is real and fusion is the energy source of the future, that would be a very large market for for diamond. And the, and the last one, coming back to the thermal management applications, I mean, what Sam talked about, thermal conductivity of 1,500 watts per meter K. This is around 2,200. Um, so again, very high-end thermal management applications. This is a, is a unique heat spreader. Right. Um, so the next question is for Stacy. Um, what's what's the largest diamond wafer size that, that can be grown today, possibly? So depending on the application, um, whether it's thermal or optical, we can probably go uh, up to um, a little greater than a two inch diameter on the uh, on the optical, two to three inch diameter, and then we can go as small as you know 120 micron. Uh, uh, coding depending on the, uh, the material that needs to have that uh, applied to it. So we're probably in that two to three uh, inch diameter. Okay. Um, and the next question is for Oliver. Uh, what's kind of the best substrate for growing diamond? Uh, it depends what you're trying to do. I mean, <laughs> I mean if you want to take it off afterwards, I mean, you know. <laughs> And so, you know, a lot of my high background. High power actually, electronic applications. Oh, right. I don't really do that. I mean, you know, I, I, I do a little bit of thermal management. Uh, and when we're doing that, we're integrating into gallium nitride with aluminum nitride on it. So we don't have control over the substrates. We're, you know, that's dictated to us. And um, for a lot of the 
other thermal stuff we do, it's usually grown on either silicon or molly and removed from it. And it, there are reasons why you'd want to look. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's a best one. I mean, we use a lot of silicon because it's cheap and easy to etch. And we, like I say, we do a lot of very thin material for MEMS. And, and the, some of the acoustic devices as well tend to be uh, grown onto silicon. Um, and that's kind of an integration thing. Um, sorry. Yeah. So I, I don't think there is a best one. I think it depends what you're trying to do. Right, right, right. Um, so I guess the, the next question uh, is for Dr. Lee. Um, are diamond heat spreaders available for standard, you know, gain on silicon carbide devices as well? Yeah, I believe so, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just like to correct my, my, my answer. Sorry, I wanted to get back to the size of it. I, I was thinking more on thicknesses, but it's probably more in the, you know, uh, 100 millimeter, 200 millimeter diameter, somewhere in that area some of the thickness or the diameters we can do. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. Um, let's see if there's any other questions. That... I, think, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Um, so thank you everyone um, for taking the time uh, today to you know, join um, being part uh, of our webinar. Um, I definitely enjoyed being a part of this discussion and I definitely learned a lot, um, you know, especially having experts within you know, different backgrounds um, and different businesses kind of made me even more excited about you know, the abundant possibilities and applications uh, utilizing DEM technology. So um, as mentioned before, uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be sent to you uh, to your emails within the next 24 hours um, for you to you know, view again or you know, if you wish to share with your colleagues. Um, I'll also be sending out uh, post-webinar surveys uh, within the next couple of days. So if you could take an hour or a moment to kind of fill those out, uh, we would definitely greatly appreciate it. Um, so I guess that's it for today. Um, thank you to our listeners uh, for tuning in and thank you to our five panelists for taking part. So thank you so much, Dr. Lee, Stacy, Professor Oliver, uh, Dr. Philip and Daniel. Thank you so um, much. Hope, yeah. hope, all of you, uh, hope you and all of your loved ones uh, stay safe and healthy um, and we definitely wish to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right.